Hello and welcome back to another edition of Easy Theory. So today we're going to be looking at a question that I got on a recent live stream, which is this one, about why do we have three pumping lemma conditions? And the three conditions that were specified are these three down here. So why do we even have these conditions? Why do we actually need them? And th it turns out the answer is really surprising. So what do we... Where do we even get these conditions from? It turns out that we get them from the proof of the pumping lemma. So if we think about what the pumping lemma says, it says that for any regular language here, there's a pumping constant P such that if you pick any string in the language with length at least P, then you can break up that string W into three parts such that the first two pieces have length at most p, the middle piece has length at least one, and if you put as many copies of the middle piece as you want into the string, pumping the string, we will always be still in the language, no matter which, no matter how many times we pick that uh, string y, how many times we put it in. So why do these conditions exist? Well, they actually go back to the proof. So how do you actually prove this thing? Well, if L is a regular language, and it can be any regular language at all, we don't know anything about it. It can be finite, it could be infinite, it could be anything. So all that we know is that there's a DFA or an NFA or something for it. So we know that there's a DFA for it of some structure. We don't know anything really about it other than, well, it has a start state because they all have a start state. And let's just say for sake of argument that they have final states. But what does this mean? Well, let's suppose that this thing has P states, where the P here actually reflects the pumping constant here. So if we look at a string of length P, so W1 up to WP, well, if we feed this string into the DFA, then we will see p plus one states because before we've read anything then we've seen one state the start state and then when we read one character we'll have seen two states maybe the same one etc so after reading p characters we'll have seen p plus one states but in this whole thing there are only p of them so that means that there is a ref uh, repetition and then now suppose that this is in the language of the DFA, which for our purposes means that it lands in one of the final states. So there must be some state here. It may be the start state. It may be one of the final states. It, it could be a completely different state too. But there must be some state in the middle that repeats. And there could be other ones that repeat too, but there must be at least one by the pigeonhole principle. So that means that we go from the start state, executing some number of transitions to get to that repeating state, some number of transitions out and then eventually back to the same state because it repeats, and eventually to a final state purely because we have picked a string in the language. And in the proof, what is usually done is we give these three parts names, x, y, and z. So the z part is the thing at the very end. The y part is the loop from the state back to itself. Well, not loop, but it could be any number of transitions back to the same state. And then the x part is the obviously the first part. So let's think about why these conditions are true. Well, the third one is justified purely because, well, this says that we can take the y part as many times as we want. So if we take the x part, go around the loop as many times as we want, and then eventually take the z part, well, we're still going to be in this final state regardless, which means that it should be in the language. So this is justified because we can take the loop as many times as we want. Any number of times. So, so we do need this condition actually, because um, based on these, for, if we just had the first two conditions, then we can just 
break up the string however we want according to these conditions and that doesn't really tell us anything. So we really do need this third condition. Now let's look at that second condition right here. I claim that it's also justified. Why is that? Well suppose that y was the empty string. Uh, because if y does not have length at least one, it must have length zero, and the only string that has that property is the empty string. So suppose it were the empty string. Well, that means that the transitions that go from this state back to itself involve an epsilon transition, but that's not possible because this is a DFA. DFAs do not have epsilon transitions. So this is justified because no transitions in a DFA are epsilon transitions. Cool. And then now let's look at this first condition. So this says that the y part that is the repeating part um, together with the x part which is the beginning of the string compromises at most p characters. That's just what this condition says. So this condition is actually not required. The, the second condition here is actually required purely because if we have the empty string and we put more copies of the empty string in here, then we'll never get a different string. Because if I just put more empty strings in here, I'll still have the original string that I had. So that doesn't change anything. So we do need this condition to get um, something interesting. Um, for this one, it's not actually required. And there's a very good reason for that. But why, where does it actually come from? So why do, why do we even have this condition in the first place? Well, it turns out that this makes the proofs that we do to show language is not regular a lot easier. And why is that? Well. Usually you pick a string, let's just say like 0 to the p, 1 to the p, or something like that. Well, the first p characters are all the same. So this condition, if we enforce it, says the repeating part, when it's all finished, is within the first p characters. That's just what this says. Well, then that means that the x and the y part are both in this set of zeros. If we didn't enforce this condition, then the y part can be anywhere in the entire string, could be in the ones in this case, or zeros and ones. That could be entirely possible too. So um, it's not actually required. You can, you can get around it, but it makes things a lot easier. So where does it actually come from? Well, notice here that I said that there must be some state that repeats, but there, in general, there could be many states that repeat. And what we should do is focus on the first time that a state repeats. So let's just say that this one right here is the first state that repeats. Okay, um, there must be some state that repeats. There must be, therefore, a first one that repeats. So let's look at the first one. Well, what is the worst possible thing that could happen? Well, a lot, but what is the worst thing that can happen in this case? Well, we could just go around visiting every single state in this entire DFA and then without repeating any of them. And then finally, at the very end, we go back to that same state. So we visit every single state and then eventually at the very end, hit this state uh, once we're all done which means that we've seen all p states and then did the repetition. And that's the worst possible thing that can happen because if you do anything else, you will see a repetition earlier. So to put it as late as possible, that requires looking at every state and then hitting the repeated state. Well, that means that we have seen p all p states and then the repeated state is the p plus one state which means that the number of characters we must have read in that worst possible case is p, because if we see p plus one states, that means we have read p characters. So what does that mean? Well, when if in that worst possible case, we ended up back at the repeat state, which means that we have just finished reading the y part, which is the repeat part. So since x is the beginning of the string, 
and y comes right after it, that means that y finishes within the first p characters, which means that also x finishes within the first p characters. So therefore, the length of x, y together is at most p. And the reason it's justified but not required is that the first repetition must occur within the first p characters. So it must occur within first p characters. And so why is it actually not required? Well, we don't necessarily have to focus on the first repetition. Well, as long as we focus on any p length substring of the string, so a substring of length p, then the same reasoning applies. If we pick any p length substring, then wherever state we are, then that means within those p characters, we will see a repeated state at some point by the pigeonhole principle again. So it's not required that we have to pump necessarily at the beginning, but it makes things a lot easier. So I hope that was interesting. Leave a comment below if you are able to actually formally show um, a different version of the pumping lemma that, does, that avoids this condition. And as always, um, I stream every day at 4 p.m. GMT. Um, please subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment if you found this a different way. And as always, I'll see you next time.